Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of council. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? I see none, so we'll move on to the approval of council minutes. Looking for a mover and a sector for the minutes uh, held October 23rd. Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Jacobs, discussion on the motion. All in favor? Motion carries. Is there any business arising out of those minutes? I see none, so we'll move on to Court of Revision and Drainage. <coughs> I'll be handing that over to Deputy Mayor McDonald and Councillor Dunn and I are not a member and will not be participating in the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll start with opening the Court of Revision and for that I would need a motion from Councillor Verbeke, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. All in favour? And that's carried. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest amongst the court? No? Okay, thank you. So the item for consideration tonight is the engineer's report for the Lebo Creek Northwest Branch, the new access. I believe that would be you, Mr. Sharon, at all? Yes, Deputy Mayor, sorry about that. Um, my understanding is that there are no issues whatsoever with regards to the assessment. The single landowner um, agrees with the assessment that they're being charged. Thank you. And I'm assuming there's no one here for that? Oh, nope, there's no one here. So then, fellow councillor. So the re can I read the recommendation first just to make it legit? that the engineer's report dated September 26, 2017 for the construction of a new access culvert over the Lebo Creek drain northwest branch in part lot 6, concession 7, corner of Mercy Road 7 and Highway 77 in the municipality of Leamington, the county of Essex in accordance with bylaw 75-17 be confirmed and that's moved by Councillor Rabiki, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. All in favour? Carried. And now to close the Court of Revision, moved by Councillor Jacobs, seconded by Councillor Hammond. All in favour? And that's carried. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to public meetings. And this evening we have one um, regarding a, a, bo a zoning bylaw amendment, ZBA 159. And Heather, are you taking us through this? <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship. This is a zoning bylaw amendment for um, property at 696 and 698 Talbot Road East. Uh, the applicants are 10 Tech Industrial Inc. And uh, what they've proposed to do is to rezone the property in order to reuse existing buildings on the property for purposes of a machine shop that designs and builds prototypes of systems fixtures and components for greenhouses and farming operations. Uh, they've been located in Staples for some time, but the growth of the local agricultural industry has provided growth for their business and they're now uh, looking for a larger piece of property. Uh, because a machine shop is not a permitted use under our zoning bylaw in this particular location, they have applied for this rezoning. The subject property is on the south side of Talbot Road East, just east of Mercia Road 19, and has an area of approximately 2.8 hectares or seven acres. There are two existing single detached dwellings at the front of the property. There are vacant buildings in the midsection and five existing mink sheds at the rear of the property. This site was formerly used as a commercial mink farm and processing facility and uh, that use has ceased and the property has been vacant for some time now. As I indicated, Tentec designs and builds custom prototypes or models of equipment and systems that are used in the local agricultural industry. The building that they're in right now in Staples has an area of approximately 445 square meters, which is about 4,800 square feet, and it's located at 612 County Road 8, which is in Staples. <coughs> the, 
They now require a larger building to accommodate their business needs. Their future plans for this site also include the construction of a greenhouse operation on the subject property which would allow them to demonstrate the company's capabilities to potential clients and uh, future customers. The westerly and larger of the two center buildings on the property has an area of about 575 square meters or 6,200 square feet. And this is the building that's proposed to be used for Tentex um, where, uh, workshop and offices. There are five employees in the company at the present time, three of whom are um, family. And uh, the two front single detached dwellings are being occupied already by two of the owners, so the, the two sons that are co-owners of, of the business. The proposed greenhouses, which are not part of this application, would be constructed behind the center buildings in the area that was previously occupied by 11 mink sheds that have been removed from the site in between um, the area they'd like to use for their workshop and office <coughs> and those five structures that are at the south end of the property. This part of the site is somewhat hard surfaced uh, because of the fact that they were previously buildings. The building that Tentec would like to use is constructed of concrete block. It has very few windows and doors, which make it very difficult to run services and provide heat through the building. There are sliding doors on both the north and south sides. These are not large enough for agricultural equipment. These would be more of a, a man door size. There are three small windows on the south side of this building, but they're high up on the wall. There's one, sorry, two of those windows are high up on the wall. The one that would be on towards the west side of this building, again on the south side, would be a little bit more central and a little larger than the other windows. But again, um, very few windows in the building. The walls are quite thick. Uh, because this was used for the mink processing, uh, there was a freezer and refrigerator section of the building so it has extremely thick walls and the whole thing is a uh, concrete block. That's inside and out. The previous owner attempted to market the property uh, to someone who would be able to use the refrigeration and freezer part of this building, but they were unable to do so. Tentec Industrial Inc. has indicated that the location, the quality and the size of this building and the other structures on the site are appropriate for their needs. The center area of the site, which is now vacant, will be occupied by greenhouses, as I <coughs> indicated. These greenhouses will be fully operational so that they can show how uh, their prototypes and their, uh, the items that they designed are operating in a real world situation. As per Planning Act requirements, we have given public notice by way of mail to all property owners within a 120 meter radius. We've also posted the notice on our website and we had a sign posted on the subject property and we've received no calls or letters in response. There's been no feedback. The subject property is designated agricultural under the official plan for the for the municipality and it's zoned agricultural hobby farm which is a3 under our zoning bylaw as i indicated the applicants proposed um, the rezoning to add a machine shop as a permitted use after more review of what they were proposing and more research as to what their business entails um, and meeting with their their planner it was it's been determined really this isn't a machine shop this is a unique type of a use, and um, the definition of a machine shop under our zoning bylaw is a building or a part thereof used for a broad range of manufacturing, fabricating, and assembly industries, including processing ancillary to the permitted manufacturing and assembly uses, and includes household waste recycling depots, but excludes paper and allied products industries, food, tobacco, and beverage processing, processed goods industries, raw materials processing industries, primary metals industries, waste treatment industries, 
armaments, munitions, and explosive manufacturing industries and any obnoxious use. There's minimal manufacturing involved in Tentax operation. In fact, only the prototypes are manufactured by or constructed by Tentac. The finished products are actually manufactured by someone else off the, off the property. And there's no ancillary processing that's part of this business either. They're better described as a workshop and offices for the design and fabrication of prototypes, along with the installation and servicing and support of the final built products and or systems, all for use in and with agricultural operations. The Tentec use is similar to a light industrial use that's class one, which is defined in our bylaw. Um, these uses have a low pro probability of emissions such as noise, odor, dust, vibrations. They have infrequent <coughs> movement of products and vehicles and no outside storage and the daytime op hours of operation would apply as well. The provincial policy statement states that limited non-residential uses are permitted in agricultural areas provided that the land does not comprise a specialty crop area, provided alternative locations have been evaluated with no reasonable alternative locations being available, which avoid prime agricultural areas, and when there's no reasonable locations available on lower priority agricultural lands. The PPS also encourages the implementation of healthy community initiatives, including working and living in close proximity. This is not a, a specialty crop area. Um, I'm of the opinion that this is really a lower priority agricultural property due to the fact that it's comprised of hard surfaces from the previous operation, um, the mink farm operation. Two of the owners, as I indicated, are living in the dwellings on this site, which um, comprises healthy living. You can work and live on the same piece of property, which limits the travel time um, and increases the amount of time that can be spent at home with family and friends. The County of Essex official plan also designates the property agricultural. It's the goal of the county to protect prime agricultural areas, to promote normal farm practices, and to allow and encourage a wide range of agricultural activities. Uses that would be permitted on lands designated agricultural um, would also include agricultural related uses, which would be farm related commercial and industrial uses that are small scale, directly related to and required to be close to or in, in close proximity to farm <coughs> operations. <coughs> These uses benefit from being in close proximity to the agricultural operations with which they do business. Tentex operations are directly linked and related to the local agricultural industry. They work with numerous farms, greenhouse operations, and other agricultural businesses. Um, they have clients in Wheatley and they have clients in Leamington. This location being central to their clients would minimize travel time for the applicants and their clients. The greenhouse component to their business operations would be built and run like other greenhouses and would need to be located in an agricultural area, thus making this site appropriate for their needs. I'm of the opinion that the proposed rezoning conforms to the policies of the county's OP. Leamington's official plan also designates the property agricultural and the policies of our official plan do permit small scale commercial and dry industrial uses by way of amendment to the zoning bylaw, provided that the use is directly related to and in close proximity to farm operations, includes processing agricultural goods or servicing agricultural equipment or operations, is located along a provincial highway, county road or identified truck route, and there must be adequate setback and buffering requirements to minimize potential conflicts with surrounding uses. Tentex operation is a type of dry industrial use that does all of its work for local agricultural businesses. The proximity to the businesses uh, with which they work aids both Tentec and their clients by allowing them to provide good service and support to the agricultural businesses 
in the area. The site is located along a county road. It's County Road 34, also known as Talbot Road East and formerly Provincial Highway Number 3. The building that's proposed to be used for the workshop and offices is already in existence. The proposed greenhouse, which will display their capabilities, will require site plan approval uh, before a building permit can be issued. Should there be any conflicts anticipated between Tentac and the adding <coughs> or adjacent uses, it's ex anticipated that the conflicts can be minimized and or eliminated uh, through the site plan approval process. There is already screening existing in the form of mature trees located between the existing dwelling at 696 Talbot Road East and the proposed workshop office building. As mentioned above, uh, public notice has been given. We have received no responses as a result. Um, I'm of the opinion that the application to rezone the property is consistent with the policies of the provincial policy statement and conforms to both the official plan for the county and the official plan for the municipality of Leamington. Thank you, Heather. Questions from Council? Councillor Hammond? Your Worship, thank you. Uh, Heather, uh, your report is really in-depth and goes to great lengths to explain their operation. But when I say but, I, I'm, I'm concerned about trying to be consistent with this, you know, <coughs> the decisions we make with rezoning. And when you, when you flag machine shop, or that's part of the, the, uh, the application, um, I'm reminded of one that we've already rejected going back a few months ago. I think you're familiar with that one. And can, can you lay out for me the differences between these two to help us better understand why this should be allowed when the other one was rejected? Yes, through you, Your Worship. Um, this particular site is much different than the Bergen property, which is the one to which you're referring, I believe. Um, the Bergen site is a larger piece of agricultural property. It has on it a building that's your typical agricultural building. There's nothing unique about that particular structure. This particular building is, um, it's definitely difficult to find someone that would be able to operate an agricultural business out of. Because of the thickness of the walls, because of the lack of windows and the, the doors, you don't have large overhead doors for agricultural equipment um, to access the building. Um, hard surfaces on the site also make this very unique. Uh, most of the site is occupied by the hard surfaces. That entire area between the center buildings and the five former mink sheds uh, was all previously occupied by mink sheds. In order to change that to an agricultural <coughs> use, it would take a lot more work. Um, a lot more cost would be involved as well. Um, the size of the property also uh, comes into play. This is a small piece of property. It's only 2.8 hectares or seven acres, uh, which also limits the types of agricultural uses that would be able to go on, the piece of, on this particular piece of the property. Um, for the Bergen property, I have been to the site. I have not been in their building, but I'm, from looking at it on the outside, there's no question in my mind it's a building that would be easier to find an occupant for than these particular structures would be. So I, I think it's very unique. This particular one's unique. Mr. Neufeld? In addition to all of those points, this, this uh, property is zoned agricultural, and uh, the business that was being run there was more like an industry than it was like a farm. And looking at the buildings, that's the evidence of what it was like. Uh, this was a mink farm. Um, yes, it falls under agriculture, but the fact is that it was being run very much like an industry, and the, and the buildings represent that. So I think that, that is, uh, that's a major difference uh, here. Your Worship, thank you. Yeah, I, I think I understood that. And I also, you know, in, in going through it a number of times, 
understand that their uh, their related industry, the machine shop area, is strictly for agricultural use, and I, I think the one that we're talking about, the Bergens, is is much broader than that. So, but but I thank you for your explanation. I will thank you, Mr. Neufeld. And I think uh, one other comment or two here. Um, when I look at what it is that these uh, is being proposed here is not so much manufacturing as in creating widgets. It is more in the um, innovation and um, uh, research area. And if there's anything that Leamington would love to get into, it would be getting businesses here that are interested in innovation and research. Um, secondly, the point I was going to make about the greenhouses. It's an interesting twist. I think this would be the first time that greenhouses would be ancillary to a business uh, and not the business itself. And so that's why having the greenhouses there is, is for the creating of the prototypes and as uh, Heather explained, if, if those prototypes then work within the, the industry, they go elsewhere to be manufactured. So this is really about innovation and, and research. Okay. Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Worship. Heather, I guess if it was a perfect scenario, uh, Tentec leaving Staples, they'd come uptown, they'd look, for a sp they'd look for a space in a properly zoned spot, like around Iroquois, Seneca, Industrial, one of those shops over there. So m my question is more in regards to the taxes, uh, how, how we're taxing them. I want to make sure it's fair for, you know, instead of them going to a properly zoned spot on one of our industrial lots, and going out to Highway 3 here instead. What's the, uh, how does that differ? How do we, what's the tax uh, base? How does that differ? I'll direct that question to Ms. Roach, okay? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, when MPAC does their assessments, it is all based on the use of the building. It, uh, zoning does not equate to the taxation. So it is, when they go out to assess the property, they will look at its use and assess it appropriately. Okay, so if we use an example, okay, uh, no, I think I got you, thank you. Okay, Councillor Jacobs. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I guess Mr. Newfeld has sort of got it, my one, that this property is going to be used mainly for research and development of, of products. Uh, the other question is that, um, Will this solely be geared to the greenhouse industry, or will you be looking at supporting other agricultural uh, processes going on here as well? Um, so that's that's going to be a question to the proponent. So we're not quite there yet. Well, I'll hold off then. Yeah. I'll so if back. you can keep that, and I'll come back to that okay, one. Okay. That. Okay. Councillor Verbeke. Mr. Mayor, three. I have uh, three little points here. I just want to know that. This is just, it's almost like the Canadian Tire trailer bylaw. This is just strictly a bylaw for this property. So we're not going to start touching any other welding shops or machine shops that are currently running the gray area. Mr. Neufeld? Correct. Okay. I would like to know then, uh, this, what, what, what do you consider hard surface, uh, Heather? Is that pavement or cement in the picture? Through you, Your Worship, I don't believe it's cement. It looks like, uh, like a, almost like a heavy gravelly type of a surface. Glad you said that. Thank you for that. That's all I need to know. And Peter, I was a little put off by you saying that Mink Farm is an industry because I want to make sure that uh, other people who live beside Mink Farms, because if it's an industry, MOE will not be involved if there's an issue come up. So I just want to make sure that it's still an agricultural business, just to make sure that we don't run into another catch-22 here. Thank you. It, it is still an agricultural, it, well, it's, it's the province that, that calls it an agricultural business. So, well, that's a description of how the, I mean, we could say that about greenhouse operations, they're an industry too, but they're still called farms. So, um, I had Councillor Wilkinson again. Just a comment back to what, Councillor Hammond was asking there before with the prior example we had out on the 5th. I had the same concerns with this when I first read it too, but the big difference I see here too is the, the place out on the 5th, they never, they tried to get away with it out there. They got caught is why they ended up in front of us then. Tentec on the other hand though, 
is coming to us and you know laying out their case and good reasons why we should allow this so I think that should uh, play a huge factor into this as well okay so we do have a question um, if there's no more for administration then I'll call the proponents forward and Councillor Jacobs does have a question So I'll just ask you to introduce yourselves for the records. Good evening, Your Worship and Council. Jackie Lasseline. I'm agent representing Mr. Friesen in the requested zoning bylaw amendment for the property at 696 County Road 34, also known as Talbot Road. Um, thank you, Heather. Uh, I'm in a fortunate position to be able to say I concur with everything <coughs> Heather has said. It does conform with the official plan for both the county and the town, and uh, it does comply with the bylaw, comprehensive zoning bylaw, as well as being consistent with your PPS. I do want to highlight a couple of points just to emphasize that Tentec is a small, small scale machine shop, isn't quite the name, but it was the only label we could give it that's in your comprehensive zoning bylaw. What they do, they design, they do the research, they create a prototype, they go to the client's shop, they look at the problem and come up with a solution. It's not a manufacturing, it's not an industrial activity. Um, they will not be having any equipment there other than what's normally found in a barn that my husband probably has or wishes that he had like a tabletop grinder and your hand tools. The biggest aspect about this is, as, in addition to the research and development that occurs at the facility, the client and um, the staff, they go and attend at the different businesses. And the businesses consist of other greenhouses and, as well, uh, other produce handling facilities, such as Cavendish Farms and uh, we do a lot of work for <coughs> excuse me uh, Bolt House Farm Cavendish uh, Farms. We do a lot of work for uh, Highline Mushrooms, uh, Bellwood Poultry Farms. Um. So it's a matter of going to the facility to find out what the problem is and come up with the solution. And back at the um, the shop, that's where they develop the the solution. This is a perfect position for the company of Tentec simply because of a number of reasons. One, they're dealing predominantly with agricultural uses, agricultural businesses. They're dealing with greenhouses. They're in the community that they're serving as clients. Also, they tend to deal with time-sensitive uh, facilities. When you have you know, Highland Mushroom, their conveyor belt system has gone down. They need somebody now. They can't wait for two or three days. Their product won't let them wait for two or three days. Um, the barn is a unique facility. It, it really was designed and handles the processing of, a facility, uh, processing of a product. In this case, it'll become that workshop. Um, it's heavily soundproofed. There's a substantial amount of insulation. They've got small rooms with low ceilings. Um, it really doesn't warrant, nor can it accommodate uh, farming with the big tractors. Jackie, if I could just interrupt you. I, Councillor Jacob, has your question been answered? Uh, somewhat, but Ms. Lasseline and her comments here are opening up a whole new avenue of uh, interest here. Okay, all right. I just, I just didn't want you to go over the, the same sales pitch that has yes, already been presented to us. Yes, and I'm trying to, to avoid that, absolutely. <coughs> absolutely. So I just wanted to indicate that it is a unique situation and every zoning bylaw amendment application is reviewed under that unique situation and it fits in the circumstance. Now, going back to the original question, I'm sorry, Councillor Jacobs, uh, through to you, mm -hmm. Your Worship. Um, the question... Uh, if I may, Your yes. Worship. Uh, well, the original question I had was research and development. I guess you've sort of cleared that up. My second uh, part of the question was the, uh, in respect to other agricultural-related uh, corporations or companies. 
uh, are you dealing with them as well? And strictly yes. within the agricultural area, or are you doing outside work, say for Chrysler's GM or, or whatever? I guess that's where I was going with that. Uh, no, as far as Chrysler's that, we do no automotive uh, related uh, work at all. Uh, and uh, going back to the greenhouse, the research and development, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we can see that's not a big enough property there to do a big greenhouse farm. We have just received uh, a North American patents on a new greenhouse construction design, and we also have three other patent pendings on growing methods and a few other that I don't really want to elaborate on right now. But uh, that is where uh, what this would be would be a research and development plot for the new construction design and also for the other patents that are, are going to be coming through. And, and the reason I was asking that, I didn't want to see this. Uh, I mean, as uh, Mr. Neufeld and uh, as Virsh is saying here that, you know, this is exciting to see something related directly to the agricultural industry here and research and develop in that particular area. My concern is, is that I just don't want to see this thing going sideways and all of a sudden we're doing, you know, this becomes another great big tool and die operation or, or something not supporting what we're actually looking for here. I think that's, that's great. Um, but Ms. Lasting, you mentioned comments about doing uh, other companies, say like Highline, you're saying about if their conveyor systems go down, are you going to be doing all that work out there or do you do that on site or like what's the process? Uh, there'd be some of both. Sometimes there is uh, work that needs to be done at the shop there. Uh, we do have welding machines there, we do have a machine shop, we do have a lathe and milling machine, so we do do some machining. Uh, we service, uh, we do other things for uh, for the uh, agriculture industry, we, we lag uh, with a, a polyurethane, we do a lagging for conveyor rollers, uh, is another small portion of our business. Uh, and if there's uh, shafting or there's rollers or something that needs to be machined, we do have that service as well. Okay. If there's, if there's no other questions, Your Worship, I'll move the recommendation. Were there? Okay. So moved by Councillor Jacobs, support by Councillor Hammond. Discussion on the motion at all? All in favor of the motion then? Opposed? And carried. Thank you very much. <coughs> Although it was a public meeting, I should have gone to the public, but I don't think anybody's here for that. Because yeah. I know you're not here for that, so... <laughs> All right, then, uh, we'll move on to reports of staff and delegation. The first report is one regarding the Ontario Municipal GHG Challenge Fund application. Mr. Sharon. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, the recommendation before Council tonight is that the GHG, GHG Challenge Fund application be supported, um, that the Town of Tecumseh be the lead applicant in the GHG Challenge Fund application, uh, which is being prepared by Essex Energy Corporation, and that the municipalities of Leamington, LaSalle, and Amherstburg uh, be partners to that application. Uh, and that council approved tonight an amount of up to um, $15,000 um, for the preparation of that application. Um, just as an aside, before I get into more details of the report, um, that application was actually Due, was supposed to be due um, to Grants Ontario today, though we received uh, information today that um, they're having problems with their portal and therefore they've delayed this, this application for a couple days. Um, and I will admit that in setting, in, in preparing our schedule um, to bring this before council, I actually misjudged the fact that um, yesterday was a holiday and I, I thought I had a whole day in which to give them the resolution. But they confirmed that the, the application would have been fine. Uh, Peter um, wrote them a letter basically saying that as a CEO, he endorses it and that this report is going before council tonight. Um, the re report itself, uh, the GHG Challenge Fund, it's part of Ontario's uh, Climate Change Action Plan. Essentially, it's their intention, uh, the province's intention, uh, to use um, funds that are generated um, from the cap and trade program that they're implementing <clears throat> um, to help fund uh, projects that will help reduce the amount of greenhouse gases um, that are produced. Um, this particular application, it's um, specific to municipalities, um, although you know, municipalities can enter with partners like, like Essex Power. 
Um, so the application that they're submitting um, includes a six megawatt solar cell uh, in one of the communities. Um, going to that has the exact location hasn't been uh, selected yet. Uh, although the pro proceeds from the uh, solar project uh, would be split amongst the four municipalities equally. Uh, in addition to the large uh, solar power cell um, that would basically be owned and managed by Essex Energy, um, part of that application also includes uh, for some electric vehicle charging stations in the four municipalities. Um, we would be the essentially the owners um, as a municipality of these charging stations. Now we haven't determined the number of them, the location, um, though that is the, the concept um, behind the application uh, if in fact Essex Energy uh, is successful. Um, and at this particular point, that's the extent of, of the application. Um, and we're just looking for council to endorse it to be a partner in that greenhouse gas challenge fund application. Thank you. Questions, Councillor Jacobs? Thank you, Worship. For the general public's knowledge, could you identify the acronym GHG? Oh, it's a <laughs> I know it's greenhouse, but I just for. Yes, through your mayor Patterson, greenhouse gas. Move, moved by Councillor Jacobs, support by Councillor Dunn. Discussion on the motion. All in favor? Motion carries. Move on to the next uh, report is one uh, noise bylaw exemption request by the Salvation Army. Ruth. Thank you. The municipality did receive a request from the Salvation Army for an exemption from the municipality's noise bylaw. Uh, the request is for the purpose of facilitating outdoor events relating to their youth drop-in program. Um, those events will take place in a field adjacent to the church building located at 88 Setterington Street. And there is a map uh, in the report indicating the location. Uh, the request for per is for permission to hold outdoor sport activities for youth every Tuesday night from 5.30 till 7.00 and to project outdoor movies the last Friday of each month from seven till nine. The outdoor sports activities will have some noise related to children yelling or cheering, and of course the outdoor movies will include the sound and music relating to the film. The applicant has advised administration that they have contacted the neighbors within close proximity to notify them of the noise bylaw exemption request, and that at the time of writing this report, uh, administration has not heard from any neighbors expressing concern. So it is recommended that council grant an exemption from the noise bylaw uh, between the hours of 5.30 and 7 every Tuesday um, for one year starting November 21st for outdoor sports activities for the Salvation Army Youth Drop-In Program and that council also grant an exemption uh, from the noise bylaw for uh, between the hours of 7 and 9 the last Friday of each month beginning on November 24th for one year for the purpose of projecting outdoor movies. Thank you. Questions, comments from council? Where do you, Deputy Mayor moves the recommendation and supported by Councillor Dunn. Discussion on the motion. All in favor? Motion carries. Uh, next report is one regarding the renewal of Seacliff Park concession stand operations lease. Ruth. The Seacliff Park Concession Building consists of washrooms, change rooms, and a food service facility. Also, ha it has a fenced-in patio and seating area. The washrooms and change rooms are open and maintained daily from June until mid-September by, by municipal staff. And the food si service facility is approximately 20 by 28. It's open space. It has all utilities. It includes a wash station, storage area, and washroom facility. In 2012, a request for proposal for the operation of this food service facility resulted in three proposals being submitted. Council approved entering into a three-year operational lease with Jatani Enterprises for the concession. And the facility is now open from Victoria Day weekend through Labor Day weekend each year. The term of the operational lease expired on September 30th, 2014, but a renewal was approved by council for a term that expired this September in 2017. The municipality is in the process of reviewing opportunities to re revitalize its waterfront, as council is aware. It is anticipated that this process will take, uh, take place over several years <coughs> as plans are developed and implemented. 
As a result, a commitment by the municipality to a long-term operational lease is not reasonable. And although the tenant sought a longer term um, lease, administration is proposing and we have uh, confirmed with the tenant that they agree in principle to a lease renewal of only two years with the following uh, further amendments to the previous versions of the operational lease agreement. In connection with rent, in the final year of the 2014 to 17 lease, the tenant was paying rent of $1,040 plus HST for each of the three months. The renewal provides for the payment of rent uh, as follows. In June, July, and August of 2018, the rent payable by the tenant shall be $1,250 plus HST. And the following year in those three months, the rent payable by the tenant would be $1,275 plus HST. The original operational lease agreement allowed the tenant to sell only beer and coolers and that was later amended to include the sale of wine. Short-term amendments to the agreement have previously been approved by Council, allowing the tenant to sell other liquor products. This proposed renewal allows for the sale of all alcohol products, but such products must be consumed on the premises and served in plastic cups or cans, and alcohol is not served after 11 p.m. It is relevant to note that currently the food service facility includes only a countertop for preparation and electrical outlets. The 2018 budget to be proposed to Council includes provisions for the installation of a kitchen, including a fryer stove and a hood fan. The total revenue that would be received by the municipality over the two-year term of the operational lease agreement is $7,575. So it is recommended to Council that it uh, approve the operational lease agreement with Jatani Enterprises for the Seacliff Park concession pursuant to the terms described in this report and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the agreement. Thank you very much, Ruth. So questions from Council to admin? Councillor Dunn? Through you, Your Worship. My question is regarding the, uh, the amount of cost that we're talking about when it comes to the kitchen, including the fryer, the stove, the money we're going to invest in the 2018 budget. Sorry, Councillor, forgive me. I wasn't prepared for the question. <laughs> something else. No, I was just curious how much the, the are we anticipating the cost to, to upgrade the facility for mm. the kitchen, the fryer, the stove, the hood, what we're look, looking at approximately? Yes, I, I think it's around $30,000, Councillor. Okay. Councillor Hammond. Your Worship, thank you. Uh, as a point of clarification, um, during that period of time, is the lease responsible for the utilities or, are, or is the municipality? I'm going to have to take a look at the agreement because I do believe that they, uh, they are responsible for the utilities. But if you just give me one moment, I can check into that. Oh, it's not. Okay, so sorry, the municipality pays for those utilities. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. To that point, uh, in light of the fact, you know, we are going to be putting in some more... Uh, equipment that is going to use more I'm thinking about gas and some other things maybe it'd be prudent on our part to monitor the use of this um, for future I mean if we're looking at a two-year lease here for down the road so we know exactly what our profit is we're generating a, you know we're showing a $7,500 income but that's not necessarily a, a profit yeah. no and I don't believe it was really um, meant to be a profit I believe it's meant to Pro provide a service to uh, the people that are using the, the beach facility. Well, again, I just, uh, I'd like to make the recommendation that we look at uh, monitoring the use of, or how much of those utilities are, so we have a better feel in two years as to what we're spending. Thank you. Okay, I've got Councillor Verbeke first. For the Mayor, uh, what is going to happen down there, or is it some secret, uh, revitalize the waterfront? We kind of know what's going to go on, so I mean, we're assuming that's going to take the path to revitalize the waterfront. I guess before you answer, Peter, my question is also uh, why you have accepted that a long-term op operational lease is not reasonable. I think if they're going to invest in this and stay there, and there's been really no complaints, that I think we should be looking at at least a three, if not four-year term, because you say it's going to take several years to implement this uh, revitalization. 
and maybe then uh, after two years, I don't know, are you putting this out RFP? Was this RFP? Is this part of their lease agreement? They get next to, you know, there's some maybe unanswered questions, but I think that uh, for what they're doing, that it should be a, a longer term than two years. So, well, I guess the next council is going to look at it then. So, Mr. Neufeld, do you want to address those points? I, I will try. Um, as uh, Councillor uh, Verbeke indicates, there are a lot of questions that aren't yet answered. Uh, this is a, uh, a work in progress, and uh, we thought that it would be uh, best suited uh, for a shorter term, given that uh, the opportunities may change. And um, it's not only for the protection of the municipality and what's in the best interest of the municipality, but it's also in the best interest of uh, those providing the services because as opportunities change, um, perhaps it will, they will want to see a change in, in the lease. So we figured that over the next two years, the plans at the waterfront should at the very least solidify. Uh, they may not all be completed, they may not be carried out, but at least they will be solidified. And uh, we don't know exactly what all the opportunities are going to be at the waterfront, but certainly there have been inquiries already about what's going to be happening down there. So this is an interim uh, solution. It's not to uh, show any uh, displeasure with the services that are being offered. It's simply to say, we don't know what that world's going to look like down there in, a, in 24 months, but we should have a much better idea what it will look like uh, for, the, for the long term in the next 24 months. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm really tickled that the Jitanis are going to do this because it sure beats us doing it. For, for this price, th this is really good return for our money. Um, and it, it's providing a service, especially in the light of what we've done with the, um, what do you call that? Big, no, beyond the, the, the amphitheater. The amphitheater yeah. So then I'd like to say further to Councillor Verbeke, when I look at 2012 is the year we first looked at this. Look, look what we've done in the five years. So to tie us into um, a longer lease, I, I, don't, I don't think that would be wise for all of us. Um, I, I think we need to take baby steps, and then I think, see this as a, as a wise move all the way around. And just the fact that we're putting in the kitchen is mighty fine for everybody, for you folks, for our people, for us to be able to provide that, I, I think we're I think we're being prudent, and yet we're still being um, aggressive to a degree. We're doing some things that have haven't been done in how many years from from the day not that I was alive then, but you know when they had that big white <laughs> building up there, days of the Heinz picnic when tons of people went down there. Then we had that lull where it wasn't a well used park. Now we've got a park that's a jewel in the not only the community but a jewel in the in the uh, region, as you know, lots of people from outside come. So, so to me, I, I'm good with that, Larry. I, I, I think we need to take us smaller steps in this till we see where we go. Um, I, I know I'm, I'm now parroting what, what Peter said, but I, I just think it's wise till we see what happens. And, you know, everybody may have opportunity to, to, to do really well with this. So. Anyway, that, those are my thoughts. And with that, I, I'd like to move the recommendation. I think it's Well, great. I'm going to ask you to hold sure. on that because the Jatanis are here as delegation. So oh, okay. I don't, right, did you sorry. have a, okay. They do have a presentation to do, so. Well, you can come back. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. We don't really have a formal presentation. Um, we were looking for a longer term lease. Um, just the fact that we are renewing our liquor license again. So we would look for at least a lease of three years would be nice to match the liquor license. So if we're getting a liquor license for three more years, we would like to be guaranteed to have the business for that long as well. Also in terms of long-term plans, we've been there since the beginning, you know, serving hot dogs and the barbecue, no kitchen. Um, it's not really a proper restaurant. We've made a, a go of it, especially in the last two years. You know, the weather's been great. Um, so we would like if, uh, you know, could get three years to match the liquor license, that would be great. Or in terms of long term, maybe getting an optional, an option after the, the lease term so that we're, you know, committed to the business to show that, you know, as long as things are going well, <coughs> we have the first option of, you know, extending it again. Because a two-year lease is, in business is not ideal, 
right? That's very short term, 24 months. When your business is only three months long, minus your rain days or a rainy season, you're uh, kind of put back. So you're looking at 90 days of good weather, but in reality, maybe it's 40, 45 days until school's out. There's really not a lot going down there in June. Weekends, of course, people are coming out, but uh, if you get two rainy weekends in June and the beach is flooded, you have no business as well. Ruth, do you want to address that? Well, uh, just, just back to um, Mr. Neufeld's comments and, and regarding the plans that we have for the waterfront. Um, as I indicated, the Jatanis were looking for a longer term lease. Um, however, administration felt that the two years was appropriate in the circumstances, although I can understand that um, they have commitments that they would like to make. Um, the recommendation by administration is really um, remains at the two years. Um, we can certainly, if, if those plans develop more quickly, we can certainly involve the Jatanis, if appropriate at the time, in those ongoing discussions. Councillor Jacobs. Thank you, Worship. Um, in light of a presentation, you know, I, I think I have great respect for what they've done down there. They've operated that since, what, uh, 2012, has it been? We've never heard any complaints. You ran a well-organized operation with minimal facilities, as, as you stated. And um, based on that, I, I think I could recommend the three-year um, recommendation or extension of that lease because I don't think that much is going to happen. I know we're moving quite rapidly there, but I think within, within three years, we won't see that huge of a, of a change. And plus, I think they would work with any enhancements that we're going to do there during that period of time. That's my own personal opinion. Okay. Councillor Hammond. Your Worship, thank you. And uh, I somewhat concur with Councillor Jacobs in the fact that uh, you know, we do maybe owe them some... Um, some kind, well, some kind of uh, time frame that would give them a better understanding of our appreciation for what you do. So, in your rec in your in your submissions, you talked about an option, and I think that that's something that we should consider. If if the three years is off the table, then I think we should look at the option of giving them the, the first option of, of continuing on with the lease. Councillor Wilkinson. I just wonder: Were we aware of the liquor license uh, application for three years? Did we know those reasons behind that, why you're wanting a longer three-year term? Ruth? Um, quite honestly, I don't recall that being brought up at the meeting. They asked for a five-year. I indicated at that time that it was not likely something that would administration would bring forward. Um, I have concerns about offering an option, too. Again, that really ties the hands of the municipality um, when we're looking at exploring all avenues for that um, waterfront and potentially the the concession stand um, so I would not necessarily agree that an option uh, should be something that should be incorporated into this agreement um, again I go back to the the recommendation of administration in order to keep the options open for the waterfront and to allow for then this council and potentially um, the next council to explore all those options I would still remain with the recommendation of a two-year um, lease Mr. Neufeld. Uh, thank you. I, I have to concur uh, with uh, Ms. Orton. The, the two-year uh, lease is not a reflection of the kinds of services that the Jitanis have been offering. It is administration trying to look into the future of a very fast, uh, quickly evolving waterfront in in May or June uh, of 2018, the new pedestrian pier will be opening. We don't know what the effect that's going to have on our waterfront, that, and that's just one project alone. Uh, just this earlier, late last week, we received the first uh, drawings of what that uh, what that pedestrian pier is going to be like, and uh, it's it's very exciting to see these things happening. We don't know what those effects are going to be, but we know that they're going to be very quick, and we want to remain nimble in our ability to um, maximize the op opportunities that are going to come. Some of the opportunities we don't even know. Some of the opportunities we may want to go to the Jatanis and say, 
we want to enter into these new opportunities. So this is not a reflection on their services. In fact, I, I would suggest to you that the fact that we're going to put uh, thirty to forty thousand dollars into a kitchen um, down at the uh, at, at the waterfront uh, should signify that we have great confidence. Um, but we administration is trying to say let's not tie the hands of the municipality for longer than twenty four months when we don't know what the what the long term is going to look like down there, and uh, so I I have to uh, I have to agree with Ruth the. 24 months, there was reasoning for it. Uh, it's not meant to be um, uh, insulting in the least. I understand why they would like to see a longer term, but in the best interest of our ability to take opportunities in hand and run with them, I would suggest that we still remain with the 24 months, at least now. Councillor Jacobs. Thank you, Worship. And in respect to what the uh, CEO is saying here, I, I think we've worked well, or they've worked well with the municipality over the period of time. You say you respect what, what is taking place there. But in, I guess in dispute to your comments is the fact that why can't they fit into these plans no matter what you're doing? I mean, they're there, they're in operation. Um, you know, they're, they're doing a great job for us. I think that if the municipality has plans, to move forward with something. I don't know. I mean, we hope that concession is going to be staying there. You know, like I don't think it's going to be any rapid turnover or expansion or whatever you might be contemplating. But I still think a three year agreement, maybe something could be built in where hey, we want to make plans, we incorporate them in for the following year. Um, I, I don't see a big issue, personally. That's my opinion. Councillor Wilkinson. And what would be what would be the cost you'd be out if we did do something different three years down the road and what would be that cost you'd be out uh, in regards to your liquor license the liquor license I believe is between eight nine hundred dollars for a three-year term to renew but the cost that we put out to get a liquor license that the town wanted that was part of the, the RFP from the very beginning we weren't looking to serve liquor it's something that the town envisioned we had to hire lawyers, we had to go to a tribunal. The initial liquor license cost us over $7,000 just to get. And then we only served beer and coolers to begin with. The following tomato festival, we got the wine approved. And now with Hogs for Hospice, we got the liquor adjusted. So um, it's not a huge income for us. We're not selling lots of liquor down there. The, obviously the biggest weekend is our Hogs for Hospice event that brings a lot of business to the whole town. So, you know, we're partners with them, uh, the Hogs for Hospice Committee. We meet with them, and we work together for that event. We host the VIP area only. We don't do the whole hill. That last year, that was done by the Kinsmen. So, I mean, when I hear the discussion coming up about making uh, exceptions for a, a third year, first choice, or whatever, that makes me really nervous because it. it leads me to think there's probably something we could be challenged with legality but I'm not a lawyer so I don't know for sure um, and I I and nothing against Jatani's I agree that I think the two-year term is going to work best for us and I only base that on the discussions that uh, cannot be made public um, that the CAO and I and and certain members of administration are having with private investors let's say um, so I agree that not tying our hands is probably the best way to go. I mean, if two years from now we're not seeing anything happen here, we certainly carry on this discussion and, and continue on. But we really don't know what's, what's going to come for sure, with any certainty, to the waterfront. So I, I'm really good with just waiting, just going with the two year as has been recommended by admin. Um, I, I'd love to say five. I think for the time being, we need to make sure that the municipality has that ability to, to jump when we when we are asked to jump. And I think the two years is the best way to go. So that's just my position on this. It will be council's decision. Deputy Mayor. I agree with you on this one um, as well. I, I, I think that we have other opportunities. I think we're showing the Jitanis that we have faith in the fact that we're investing the 30,000 in equipment. 
Um, gentlemen, I'll remind you that very often you, both of you ask for why are we not getting more quotes and, and now this time you're willing to engage in a three-year contract without asking for quotes. I'm just going to remind you where you normally come from because you've baffled me on this, totally wow. baffled me. And I'm not disrespecting you at all. I'm just reminding you where you normally come from. Um, and, and, it, and I too don't, I don't see it as, a, it's not insulting. I'm just trying to say, um, I, I think for us, we, we have to remember what's best for us. And I do think we're showing confidence in them by doing that $30,000 investment. This is actually <coughs> allowing them to, to do more as well. You know, at the very beginning, we did not want, we had people who came and they did not want us serving alcohol at all. So we, bought, we, we too, council made some concessions and, and we, we had pressure. So I, I feel that this is, we're, we're trying to meet everybody with the hand extended we give, they give, and, and to me that I'm, I'm going to, to vote that we just do the two-year, just to let you know. Councillor? Uh, thank you, Worship, and, and no disrespect taken, Deputy Mayor. I, I know exactly where you're coming from, and the only reason I'm saying this is I think that, you know, going back to my original statement, I, like they've done a great job down there. And, uh, you know, I, personally, I couldn't see them taking it on in the first place because all they could do is sell a hot dog or or whatever over the counter. So it was a great, uh, I guess, uh, leap in faith that they even did it. And I guess just, uh, I feel that a three year lease at this point in time really isn't gonna put us out that much and it will assist them. And I guess I ought to say thank you for what they have done in the past. So I would still go with a three year recommendation, but however you wanna put it out here. So we're looking for council's direction on this. No, she was going to. Do you do you want to you move that the recommendation as proposed, seconded by Councillor Dunn. So further discussion on the motion. All in favor of the motion as presented and opposed. So you're in favor. Better than the nothing. Okay. So two it is. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, can I, I just have one question? Sure. You guys keep saying something about opportunities. Opportunities for who? For the entire municipality. We're, for the entire, yeah, okay. we're we're looking at all sorts of options on the waterfront, uh, businesses that might choose to locate there. It, it's hard to say anything without getting in trouble. So I understand. Okay, we <coughs> we built that business from nothing. We went through. Sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm going to say what I have to say. It's okay. Because they don't know what we've gone through from the liquor board, from destroying our reputation at Burgess at the Dock with the liquor, uh, with people making up false rumors how we were going to serve it, which we never wanted to go through it, um, from losing money left and right from rainy days. Um, we've worked with every committee, every special uh, promotion, like events, we've uh, we've never once broken any rule, mm -hmm. okay, with anybody. We work with every municipality, every event, and then now you're telling us you want to give us two years without an option. So basically, for us, the two years we don't know what's going to happen after we put all our efforts, our name, our blood, our sweat, our tears in it. Um, to me, it's not right. So I'm going to have to see at this time. I won't be renewing. So you guys can put it up for tender because um, it's, it's very upsetting. It's very upsetting. Okay. Okay. Appreciate your comments. Yep. Ms. Horton. As you know, Mr. Mayor, that um, situations like this, typically the municipality would RFP a uh, operational lease. The fact that we have extended that lease for uh, several years now just does go to uh, show that the Jatanis did operate the lease in a, in a professional manner. This was certainly not anything, as Council has indicated, to reflect that they did not. And they certainly did not indicate to me that they would be making those kinds of presentations at this meeting. So I am somewhat 
taken aback by that. Yeah, thank you very much. Councillor? What happens now? Is he not renewing this one or is he not going to renew the optional third year after, like three years after? Is it done now? That's I how I took it. I would think that we might want to let cooler heads prevail and we'll see where it shakes out over the next little while. Uh, Councillor Hammond? Mayor, thank you. I think that um, in some of our discussions, um, and you're right, we need to let them uh, rethink their position here and have a chance to sit down and talk with them because uh, I think that we've scared them. I think that we've scared them in some of the comments that were made about some other options that may be coming that they're going to think, wow, maybe somebody's coming and then we're going to be gone. And I don't think that was your intent when you were talking about the other places and the other things that may be happening. And I think that's the way they took it. Undoubtedly. Um, but I'm really restricted in what I can talk about. Like, so um, I, just, I just think let them calm down. We can have further discussions. And, and worst comes to worst, then we put it out there for someone else to take it over. So Councillor Jacobs. Thank you. The only comment I want to make to that is the fact that you're absolutely right. Like some of the stuff that you're somewhat, I guess, restricted with can come forward. But then again, it puts us councillors in a different position because we're not privy to some of that information. So some of the decisions we are making or our recommendations, you know, maybe don't fit into what is taking place. And, and I guess that's where some of this, you know, I push, you push scenario comes into play. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, I wholeheartedly respect, you know, the confidentiality that has to take place in some of these negotiations. But then I guess it comes back and it sits on us as well. So I guess maybe that's where some of the turmoil comes from. And then the, 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 the other side of that is that um, you know, we have an administration who's advising us in their professional opinions on on our decision making process and so sometimes you have to place that level of trust in that they're correct right so well yep. deputy mayor but he came to this table knowing we were offering two years we didn't just pull that on him so i'm not i'm not taking blame for this i don't think any of us should no no i don't uh, that that was i think a spur of the moment decision when you looked at her face and his face and like you said let let them think about it but we did not pull anything he knew darn well what was in the report and i'm assuming they came thinking that they too were going to sign on for this so we'll we'll wait and see like you said what shakes out but i i, I don't think we did anything wrong mr newfeld and and just to add you know there there's been an assumption made um yes things could change down there but what could change is that more services are required from the people who are offering the services down there. Uh, there could be opportunities for whichever service provider has the contracts down there. So um, that's why we're trying to keep this open. We, we don't know what the future holds and uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, hopefully, um, hopefully they will uh, <coughs> rethink their position and open uh, the lines of communication <coughs> with administration again. Okay. So We'll move on to the next item on the agenda then, which is the uh, Comprehensive Business Licensing Bylaw. Ms. Percy. <laughs> Council will recall in 2016, administration was directed to bring forward a bylaw respecting licensing and regulating businesses operating in the municipality. A bylaw was prepared and taken to public meeting consultation was held with stakeholders at two sessions, October 2nd and October 3rd. A copy of the minutes from the stakeholders' feedback sessions are attached to the report. In addition to the public consultation with external sources, legislative services met with building, planning, fire, legal services, bylaw, the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit, and the Ontario Provincial Police. The process uh, for the business licensing application, uh, the applications will be made available at the municipal building or on the municipal website. The completed application will be submitted to legal legislative services who will coordinate the internal approval process and inspections, ensure all documentation required by the business owner has been received and will issue the business license. The fees assigned to the business license depends on the type of business. 
The fees have been developed by taking into consideration the cost to administer, to inspect and enforce each license type and also through a comparison of other municipalities by licensing <coughs> fees. Previously businesses registered were done at no cost. The cost of administrating and enforcing the associated regulations should be borne by a business and not by the public through the general tax base. The plan for the implementation of the business license is expected to take about a year to complete and businesses, as businesses are required to be licensed in a specific category are due at different months of the year. Home occupations and all general businesses, for those businesses that are not listed in Schedule 1 of the bylaw, will be required to make application in January. Phasing in the licensing regime allows administration time to process numerous business applications, including inspections by fire, building, bylaw, and the health unit. Accommodating all business applications on January 1st would not be feasible. Expiry dates for a business license is determined by that license type. They're spread throughout the year for resource manage management purposes and to meet the needs of the stakeholders. The ongoing yearly expiry will help to ensure that appropriate standards are maintained, information gathered for all licenses is current, while providing a cost recovery process for the entire licensing program. The focus of the first year of the business licensing program should be on education and outreach activities to inform business owners and the public of the bylaw and requirements to obtain a business license. Education and outreach is often the most successful means of ensuring long-term compliance and is generally less time-consuming and resource-intensive. Education outreach activities may include providing information pamphlets to the public, meeting with business owners to review the application and also the bylaw, speaking at venues to provide information on licensing, referring business owners to appropriate agencies for additional information in running a business, for example, uh, HST information, a public awareness campaign, which it could include publishing a series of ads in the paper, advising the BIA and the Chamber about communicating the requirements under the business licensing bylaw to their members and community partners. The goal is to attain voluntary compliance. However, matters that cannot be addressed through education and voluntary compliance will be enforced through the enforcement provisions contained in the bylaw. With respect to financial impact, administration is unable to determine with any accuracy the number of businesses operating in the municipality. As such, we cannot provide an estimated financial impact associated with passing the business licensing bylaw. There will be an impact on staff resources. Sorry, there will be an impact on staff resources. The tooth and education. The 2018 budget will include the revenue from application fees and include costs for contract staff to assist with the implementation of the licensing bylaw and to ensure success of the program. The program will be reevaluated so, so that those impacts can be assessed and included in the 2019 budget. The recommendation before Council is a bylaw to provide for the licensing and regulating businesses in the municipality of Leamington be presented to Council for consideration. The bylaw come into effect January 1, 2018. Administration be authorized to submit set fines created under the bylaw to the Ministry of Attorney General for approval and administration be directed to bring forward a bylaw to amend the 2018 user fee bylaw to include the licensing fees as set out in the report. We, uh, just to clarify the business licensing process, I did a diagram up. You can scroll down a bit. So we're using a yoga studio as an example. This individual wants to have a yoga studio in their house, so they would require a general business license annually. That would include completing an application and providing the documents required under Section 22 and 23 of the bylaw. Because it's a home occupation, they'd also require a home occupation clearance. This is a one-time inspection by building, fire, and bylaw enforcement unless there's changes to the dwelling. This individual wants to open a yoga studio in a commercial location. They would require just a general business license for an annual, with an annual renewal. The next example would be a catering business. 
in, in a person's home. Because the catering business is included as one of the Schedule One business licenses, they would be required to complete an application and submit the documents contained in Section 22 and 23 of the bylaw and also submit the documents that are set out in the appendix of the bylaw under catering. They would also require home occupation clearance. Again, it's the one-time inspection. Now, a catering business in a commercial location. Again, because it is listed as one of the businesses that have additional requirements, they would require an application, the documents contained in Section 22 and 23 of the bylaw, and the documents that are set out in Appendix C of the bylaw. So I hope that makes it a little bit clearer. Good examples. So hopefully it helps. Questions? Councillor Wilkinson? I have more questions, but just going back to that quick slideshow, I wasn't expecting that. When it <coughs> comes to the, the catering portion there, the um, uh, permission from Health Canada, does that fit under the bylaw section then, the bylaw enforcement? I don't see anything about, I see building fire and bylaw enforcement. Where would the Health Canada inspections be in that part? Because, sorry, because catering business again is in a Schedule 1, it has additional requirements. General business licenses do not require that a business provide a health inspection. The catering business in that schedule does require that they have a health inspection. So you would turn to the schedule that specifically sets out catering business. Right. For the mayor, but would you issue a license if they don't have the food handling preparation or the Board of Health? Would you still issue it prior to? Three worship. So the catering establishment, which is Appendix C to the bylaw, you, they would be required to provide the documents set out in section 22 and 23 and in addition provide proof of an inspection of the, um, by the health unit dated within one year of the application for a business license. The reason that we leave it, we have it at one year is because in discussions with the health unit, um, it sometimes depends on their workload and it may not allow them to inspect a business as quickly as a business would require to open. So they, it's easier to say within one year, the health unit feels that uh, an inspection within one year and that certificate is still valid. Councillor Dunn. Through you, Your Worship. My question is regarding the in-house businesses that are um, operating food. And I don't know if it's catering, I guess it would be considered catering. Um, if they've set and they've met the criteria in the past and opened, got a business license, going forward, is there anything that would cause them not to be, if they meet all the requirements again, from having it like in a particular area? So if an individual was operating catering business in their home, a home occupation, currently they would be required to register their business um, on the, with the business registry, and that includes, because it's a home occupation, inspection of the home by the bylaw enforcement department. Under the new bylaw, there's no grandfathering, so they would be required to apply for a business license, and again, those inspections would be required. Whether or not we would issue it is dependent upon whether or not they successfully meet the conditions and provide the documentation. Through your worship. So if they've met all the criteria before and yet this new criteria could meet that they might not be able to meet those, that's basically what you're saying, new criteria. If they've met by law, they've had the business license before, they've ran their business and had all the appropriate agencies in and we're running it and now there may be changes to the bylaw so that those same criteria <coughs> won't be met? Because this bylaw has additional requirements than is currently required of the business registry, they may not be able, to, if they're not able to meet any of these requirements, then they would not be issued a business license. Okay. Councillor Hammond. Your Worship, uh, thank you. I have a couple of quick questions and then I've got a comment I'd like to make if I can. Bernard and I had a discussion earlier on. Uh, concerning the home occupation, during the inspection process, um, is one of the things they're going to be looking at is accessibility because very few homes can comply with accessibility. 
and we all know that I, and I'm and I don't know whether that would fall under the building departments uh, inspection part of the uh, the application or not so for a home occupation the bylaw uh, enforcement officers would inspect uh, also the building department and the fire department um, it's not always required by building and fire it depends what um, the circumstances are of that home occupation so we would craft our applications to ensure that we were identifying whether or not fire and building needed to attend when bylaw inspects a home occupation they're looking for compliance with the requirements that are set out on the comprehensive zoning bylaw so for example they would be checking the signage outdoor storage parking um, that they're not impeding the main use of the building. There's a requirement that uh, someone who's operating home occupation is only using a certain percentage of the home, so they would ensure that that is um, confirmed. Checking for such things as handrails or property standards issues. With respect to barrier-free access, um, the building code does not uh, require barrier-free access. Uh, it does not apply to homes, so it would not be applicable. If I may, uh, Your Worship, thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I attended one of the uh, sessions, if you don't mind me calling you Brenda. Uh, how, many, um, how many people did you have that showed up during our sessions that actually were here to, uh, I know you and Ruth were a part of the first one I was at, and I know you had to have some sign-ins. Did you have a count on how many people showed up to hear about this registry? Without looking at the minutes, I, I'm going to guess between seven and nine persons. Um, okay, to my, to my comments, you know, I, I've gone through this a number of times. We ask for it. We need it. Um, my concern is this. I don't know, and Brenda, you had asked us some time ago, if we had questions pertaining to this document, could we get them into you so you had a chance to take a look at them? Um, when I go through this document, it, I, don't, I don't have a question because I don't have the answer to any questions. I have concerns. I, I have concerns that this document is going to... Let me go back a bit. I think we're going to need all kinds of bylaw enforcement people. We're going to need a heck of a panel of people for the adjudication of this because when I read parts of, for example, on page 23 of the document, the, the municipality may enter upon any premise or into any vehicle at any time, reasonable time, for the purpose of carrying out an inspection. I think we're going to have all kinds of people who are, I mean, I know that we're somewhat tolerant and we don't stretch the rules, but nevertheless, it's here. And that's just one or two of the ones that are an inspection. Uh, you talk about being, being able to remove documents or any relevant inspection and information. I'm thinking about home inspection. If you come into a home and start removing documents or start going through vehicles, people are going to be upset. I, um, in, in looking at, at this again, I, and I don't know how you, how you clawed back or what you do to make any changes to it. I, I looked at the section pertaining to ice cream vendors. Um, can't be in any one spot for more than 10 minutes. Have to indicate what kind of products you're selling. Well, that's pretty simple. It's ice cream. I, I don't think you want the flavors, but, <laughs> but you know, it, 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 you know, you talk about the 300, 300 feet from the nearest entrance to another building and all of those things. And I think all that is, is, is needed when they come in and make the application. You set out the guidelines for them, but I don't know where we're going to get the people that are going to enforce all of these things. And I think we're going to have a lot of pushback when, you know, you know how much pushback we get now from the taxi companies from the, and it's not anywhere near as encompassing as what this is. So, as I said, Brent, I apologize. I didn't have a specific question, more of a statement that I just don't know what you could do to claw this back. Sure. So, yes, it is a very comprehensive bylaw. And the, what we aim to do is find a balance between no regulations and over-regulating. The provisions in the bylaw, um, first of all, enforcement is by complaint basis. So the provisions within the bylaw provide us with the teeth or the tools should we require them. So obviously we use that discretion on, on whether or not we, we need to um, evoke a certain section. When you're speaking about looking at records and documents and, and inspecting vehicles, it would be the vehicles that are part of operating the business. So, taxi cabs for example 
uh, mobile vendor or um, um, catering business, if they're moving the food in, in a vehicle that's part of their catering business, it allows us to inspect that vehicle maybe to ensure that they are following the health unit guidelines on transporting foods. So it does, it does provide the teeth and the tools that Council has looked for in the past, but it doesn't mean that we have to be strictly um, enforcing every provision with that, within that bylaw. I'm going to maybe defer to Ruth a little because she is oversees the uh, enforcement. I think where the work will really be involved will be with the application process and gathering those documents and ensuring the applications are fully complete before we actually issue the license. The enforcement will, I see the enforcement as being in cases um, down the road because we did talk about the first year as being the educational year and getting the information out to uh, those people who are both operating the businesses or who wish to operate the businesses. But the enforcement will be um, those who choose not to license their business um, and going out and providing them with the information and if necessary, issuing the fines at that time. Um, once a business license is issued, because we have annual renewals, we get that opportunity to ensure that on ongoing compliance is maintained that way. Um, I don't see a lot of enforcement in that area. I see the enforcement in the area where people are just choosing to ignore the bylaw and to not license. <laughs> And that's just a simple going out and inspecting, seeing that there's a business being carried on, uh, that there's no license involved, and issuing the fine and then <coughs> prosecuting. Thank you again, Your Worship. And I, and I think that you touched on it, both you ladies, and thank you, that I think the educational process has to be with our, our enforcement people as well. Um, because if you look at this document, it, gives, it would give the impression that there's a lot of carte blanche where you can go in and inspect a number. It doesn't say, I mean, I know that you're only talking about vehicles pertaining to the Pacific, but it's just into any vehicle at any reasonable time. Um, and I think that, you know, when I say education, I think I'm on page 23, that, that we need to educate our, our, I'll say our bylaw enforcement people as well, that, you know, use some common sense and a common sense approach uh, when you, when you enter, the, enter into these people's homes for home inspections and all those other things. Not that they wouldn't, mm -hmm. but I just... Well, I'll just give you an example of some enforcement that we did with the taxi cabs regarding um, requests for documents. We wrote to them asking for the documents. Um, we requested that they deliver them at a certain time. Um, when some chose not to do that and required us to attend, we made an appointment. We attended. We asked for certain things. Um, I mean, we want to be very respectful of their business operations. So we aren't going to, it's not our intention to, um, you know, go storming into a business and demanding documents. That's just not the way we operate and that's not the way we would ever want to operate. So um, we can certainly manage that in a very respectful way of the business operators. Okay, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. I, for one, am glad we're getting some lines <coughs> drawn in the sand because I think we've been, as I said, with the taxi cabs, a bit of a wild west when it comes to um, allowing businesses to op open up hither and yon uh, without any kinds of rules in place. Uh, catering business down from you, John, that opened up and followed no rules. Um, places out in the country that are catering to the migrant workers with no regard to cleanliness or any kind of um, health rules. I, I think it's time we did that. Uh, even some of the other places that are opening up that seem to have no, we, we don't even know what they are. I, I think we've been driven to this point. I think 15, 20 years ago, we, we didn't need these kinds of rules, but, but because there's been nothing, I guess like the law goes, you take the, <laughs> You go to the lowest point, right? That's that's how I feel. We we have become with with some of these businesses operating. Uh, people have no regard for rules. So when that happens, then you have to more or less put the hammer down to a degree. But I will say, bylaws. You know, with with um, property standards, I 
I think they've gone out and they tell people the rules and regulations. Sometimes, you know, you and I feel that they need to even be a little more yeah. assertive. assertive. Yeah, so, so, so we, we already know that, that they're not going to be over and above what, what we would want. So, so for me, this is a good thing. I have a few little teeny questions. May I just flip through this? <clears throat> you know how I'm like this at budget, so what did you expect? <laughs> now, I, I know this is sort of dealt with on page 51. I want to get this out of the way right away. You know, Brenda, how there seems to be this tendency, and perhaps not a lot here, but you see it in bigger cities. I saw it in Toronto last year when we went for a weekend, where they have a pop-up business that might last for a season, such as Christmas or the pop-up business we had when Hogs for Hospice came. Is that going to be, is, is that what you're talking about on page 51 when you're talking about that three-day, um, three-day, or salesperson day sales, three-day limit? Is that something that would, fall, is that where we would get that um, pop-up business? Correct. Okay, all right, that's good then. So then, I just wanted to ask too, and you know this question came up, and I don't think I got an answer. Cemeteries, are they included in this as well? Okay, thank you. Yes, they are. Okay, great, thank you. And then I'm going to flip over to page 31, just the tail end of adult entertainment. Um, you say that after we go through all the rules and regulations, it said uh, no bi person or business shall operate an adult entertainment event within the municipality. Do you mean just the core? Or... So this provision um, is not the establishments. It would be those um, mail review shows oh, or what have you that would be at a specific restaurant, hall or bar. Okay, thank you. And then, you know, when you talk about bed and breakfast places, there's so many out there that, that I know are bed and breakfast and they don't have signage. Will signage be a requirement for a bed and breakfast to get a license, or is that something we're still going to keep on the down low? There's no requirement for signage for a bed and breakfast, but I know there are specific provisions for the size of sign if erected for a bed and breakfast. Okay, but it's not a requirement? No. Thank you. Then I jump ahead to um, food vehicles. Now you're saying in this that um, the location of the food vehicle will be on private property, zoned commercial, industrial. I think we had this come up as well at the public meeting about agricultural when we talked about culinary tourism. Is that something we could, we could add in there? Or do you see that as such an odd um, occurrence that agricultural would not come into it? You know, we were thinking of um, Teeth and Flowers and um, Hyatt's doing the the, the fish food truck. So is that something? So the purpose of those uh, public meetings were to get feedback and, and determine what uh, needed to be added or, or uh, changed in the bylaw. And an individual had indicated that he would like to have a food vehicle on his property that was zoned agricultural. We took this information back. Um, legal services and legislative services and planning uh, discussed it and it, as a result of that um, inquiry or request it's been included in the bylaw so the location of the food vehicle shall be on private property private property shall be zoned commercial recreational industrial or agricultural in uh, accordance with the comprehensive zoning bylaw oh apparently I have the version from before <laughs> I, I didn't I just because I printed it out I apologize okay so maybe okay I have well I didn't want to print it again so I had assumed sorry you know what assumptions do um, <laughs> So again, back to the food vehicles, <laughs> back to the food vehicles, they can't move around then. Uh, I think we, we had that come up where, uh, remember we had one that wanted to be in front of the art gallery at one time, they had to move along, and Jack's Gastro Pub, I believe, came in front of Superstore at one time, so we're not going to allow that type of um, instantaneous, if you will. No, the food vehicles are based on a location. So if an individual uh, would like to operate at more than one location, then they would be required to apply for each location. And the reason for that is because each location is specific to, um, is reviewed uh, according to parking, um, 
ensuring traffic flow and in this bylaw, the zoning. So they could operate from more than one location, but they would be required to apply for each location. Okay, thank you. Um, wait, some of these are self-explanatory. Yeah, I got that um, three-day sale thing. I may be almost at the end. I think I am. Yes. So anyway, I, I want to thank you, Brenda, for doing this. I know this was a long time and a big job. Um, I do feel some people may find it restrictive, but I spoke to a gentleman the other day who own, has a business in town, and he was happy to know that, yes, he'll, he'll pay this as long as those people doing the same business in their homes are paying it as well. So I, I, I really think this is going to be for the betterment of the community, um, keeping people safe for, for whatever reason, um, keeping things organized. We have tabs on it. We should be the ones that know what's going on, not, not all these things going on underneath the surface and we have no idea of what the underground economy is. So, so I'm very happy, happy, I'm very thankful. I'm sure we're going to get some pushback, but, but I think we've done the right thing. And you said we will review in a year's time. So that's good by me. Thank you. Councillor Dunn. Through your worship. Uh, Brenda, I apologize if I didn't quite understand. When it came to the food trucks, like for the Hogs for Hospice, that event coming in and how is that going to be handled? Um, are they, is it under the event? A three day event, is that what you were saying? That, that, and they won't, because they're coming in from other areas and uh, we're not gonna be inspecting each one of those. That would be under their, whoever takes on that event. So the bylaw uh, exempts those uh, that are operating under a special event permit. Um, the reason for that is because we will be capturing all the information that we need under the special event permit. So for food truck, we would be asking to see um, their health unit inspection and such. So there's no point in having them duplicate the process. So anyone who is issued a special event permit is exempt from this bylaw for the duration of that permit. And again, if I may, this, so, and I'm glad uh, Deputy Mayor brought up the one day events for the Superstore. Like we, they do bring in different vendors just to put in stuff for one day in and out. And does that could be qualified under that three day event as well then? If you could give me some more details about the event. Well, they have um, different vendors come and they will uh, uh, barbecue stuff with different uh, trucks that will do um, and either they just give the food away or um, different, they're, I guess different products that they're um, showcasing so that people just got free samples and like let's go no <laughs> so just superstore is what you're talking about they invite someone onto their property to do this right okay yes they have uh, a couple different meat companies that come in and they'll they'll barbecue stuff up and if it's promoting the, um, the product that you're already selling by way of samples, then no, I don't see the requirement. But again, if they are barbecuing or working with food products, I would recommend that they have a health unit inspection. Thank you. That also brings another question because uh, they do a charity sausage and it, um, and put the money back into Salvation Army or PC Children's Charities. So they would have to meet certain guidelines if it's just a charity event as well? They, they would, the health unit has their own requirements as to when an inspection is required. So they would need to contact the health unit to ensure that they're meeting um, their requirements with respect to inspections. Thank you. Yeah, and I would think the employer, Superstore, would want that assurance from that whoever's doing that barbecuing or cooking that they have that health inspection so I'm sure they do from head <coughs> office and all the way down to make sure exactly. that they're covered all the way across because yeah. they do duplication all the time with all that stuff anyway yeah. Councillor Wilkinson thank you your worship uh, some of my main concerns were already dealt with uh, before coming here tonight and you know speaking to this uh, it was in regards to the food vehicle uh, portion and the pawnbroker portion there's been great uh, improvements since 
it was impressive to watch Brenda and Ruth that night in the open house, you know, have an open mind and take it back and reshape this how it's done. And I think it's, we've uh, improved upon since that night. Um, I, I want Brenda to just expand on a few points that I've seen in here. The first one being something really simple. And I can't believe it wasn't in our one and a half page business license we had leading up to this, but just uh, on page 17, uh, a copy of a master business license from the province of Ontario is now a requirement. But it says at the end of that, if applicable, <laughs> can I get a brief explanation on why the if applicable is in there? So this was a provision that was requested specifically by a representative um, of the BIA. Um, so we have included that a person is required to provide a master business license, as you said, if applicable. If applicable means that um, not everyone is required to have a master business license, which is issued by the provincial government. So it is required if the person is operating a business in a name other than their own personal name. So unless their business is in their own personal name, they are required to have a master business license, which is issued through the province. It has a five-year um, term to it, and then it's required to be renewed. Um, what, one of the things that we talk about education is that we've created a handout for somebody that would explain that information. Because a lot of times when we're um, working through business licensing, we will, if someone is identified as not having a business license and we contact them, they'll say, sometimes I do have a business license and they're referring to the master business license. Mm -hmm. So we'll take that opportunity to provide education and, and explain the difference between the two. Let's drill down on that a little bit further though. Okay, most of our businesses in the uptown sector here, would they fall under that, uh, under that requirement then at that point? The businesses, are any of them in their own name then, I guess, is where they wouldn't be required, is what you just said? So in the, let's use the example of most of the businesses in the uptown section. I would probably say yes. Unless the business is operated in their personal name, they would require a master business license. Okay. Sounds good. All right. It, if, can I just add just one brief thing? Unless they're incorporated. So if they're incorporated and operating under a corporate name, then they wouldn't need a master business license either just so your own personal name or your corporate name then you need a master business license and really I just see it as a business name registration that's that's all you're doing is you're registering that business name with the government and they're producing a license that says okay now you can operate under that name fantastic I like that's in there uh, moving on to page 19 where this is for grounds for refusal points D and E. Uh, the issuer of the license believes that operating the business may be adverse to the public interest and E being the issuer of the licenses has reasonable grounds to believe that the applicant will not comply with any federal or provincial statute or regulation of or this bylaw. Can I get a brief maybe some examples why that's in there and where that would apply? So those would be situations where the uh, issuer of licenses believes that it's not in the best interest or um, safe for the public if they're operating. Um, perhaps you have a tattoo parlor that is, um, has, we've received a complaint or someone's provided information that they're using um, perhaps dirty needles. Um, the health unit is advised and until such time as they are able to come and inspect, the municipality has the opportunity through this provision to suspend their license um, until such time as it's the health units had their inspection. Okay. So D and E are kind of almost two in the same there with that example you just gave, correct? Right. So <coughs> when we talk about um, the federal and provincial or a municipal bylaw, um, that would be something like uh, if there's a history of that business not complying mm -hmm. with any of, uh, any of the provincial or federal legislation or requirements such as the Environmental Protection Act, then we can uh, suggest that or refuse their license based on that. Fantastic. That's kind of my last one. Uh, and yeah, Brenda, it's been uh, impressive to see what you've done here in the last year. And uh, I've had this talk with bylaw officers uh, coming into the building here, coming and going about this thing. I feel like we provide them with some 
bullets in their gun finally to go out there and do what we were asking them to do basically you know like the deputy mayor said get tough uh, I hear your concerns there councillor Hammond uh, and they're good ones but I we gotta let this thing play out you know uh, Brenda has done exactly what we asked her to do here and done it very well um, I, I sure I sure as heck hope that it improves conditions in the area that's described around here um, I look forward to seeing how this goes uh, and how it's received um, but fantastic job there Brenda thank you Councillor Jacobs thank you worship I had whole bunch of questions too but I guess most of them got answered in some of the comments we had earlier the only one I have left here is the fact that uh, non-farm like uh, like these farm fruit stands out front selling our tomatoes and cucumbers and so forth are exempt from this because it's they're part of their operation I believe but what about the ones that are selling local products uh, off a farm wagon or whatever I think you know what I'm referring to here do they need a business license now or because it's local produce that they're selling yes they can apply for a license and they likely will not get it um, because they're it would not be appropriately zoned for that kind of an activity so the the, the stands that are on uh, a farm parcel that is allowed under the um, zoning bylaw so, um, and we're not regulating or licensing farm operations or greenhouse operations. That would just be simply too onerous um, for our department to handle. Um, so unless they can fit into a category that is listed within the, um, the licensing bylaw, um, I don't see that kind of an operation operating. It's not a food vehicle necessarily, although they can make submissions as to why it should be considered a food vehicle, and then we can certainly look at the application and determine whether it fits within that category. And then, of course, if, if we do de determine that it should be refused, they would have the appeal mechanism. So in this particular case that we're referring to would be an individual purchasing, wholesale, selling retail, basically, in a lot, uh, regardless whether it's a local growing or, or not, they would have to apply for a license and fall under the rules and regulations as set forth. I think that was going to serve a lot of our issues. Thank you. Councillor Hammond. Yeah, Your Worship, thank you. And just a comment I want to thank, uh, too, as Councillor Wilkerson indicated, thank Ruth and Brenda and Brenda for coming in tonight on her hand and fielding all the questions that we have. So thank you, ladies. So ultimately then, um, I, I knew all of you would have a whole bunch of questions, so I'm, I'm very, very pleased, because they're all great questions, things that we need answered. The, the best question asked me tonight was, who asked for this bylaw anyway? And, and that was in response to Councillor Hammond saying people are going to get mad when, they, when we go out there and start enforcing these things. Well, people are already mad because we're not enforcing anything. So, and it was the, the the uptown business sector it's other business areas that we have they're the ones who came to us in the first place and said and we've been saying for years i mean as as past business owners ourselves we've been saying this isn't fair what's happening we're paying our taxes based on where we are and these people are operating under the radar so <coughs> excuse me i'm I was more than pleased when I got through this whole thing and that was a long long bylaw so <coughs> Excellent job from from both of you, all of you who, who are involved in it, and and I agree with everything councils has said here. And I, I, I am very comfortable knowing that even if we move ahead on this tonight, that if something comes up that is not quite right or needs to be adjusted as the year or years go by, we know we can come back here and and fix it. So. Um, I, I look forward to this being instituted on in, in January 1st. So I will simply ask the question of Council, what are your wishes? Deputy Mayor moves, support by Councillor Hammond, discussion on the motion, all in favor, and carried. Next uh, report is one regarding the awarding of a contract of animal control services. Ruth. So I'm going to go into a little bit of history 
um, right now regarding um, animal control. Um, so when the uh, municipalities of um, Leamington and Kingsville, um, at the time of amalgamation of, of those municipalities into two uh, municipalities, Leamington entered into an agreement with the town to create a joint animal control committee comprising those municipalities and they set out terms of a joint animal control of joint animal control and the operation of the joint pound which is located in Kingsville. According to that agreement the cost of maintaining and operating the pound facility including the expenses for utilities, minor repairs, insurance, maintenance and replacement of equipment snow removal, accounting, wages and salaries were apportioned based upon the average use of each party averaged over the past three years. Any capital repairs and improvements to the pound itself were shared equally between Leamington and Kingsville. The contract between Leamington, Kingsville and the current animal control and pound services provider has remained in effect since 2002 generally with incremental annual increases in the contract fee. The current provider advised that he would end his contract effective December 31st, 2017. An RFP was released. The deadline to submit proposals was September 28th and two proposals were submitted. Those proposals were evaluated by a team made up of an equal number of Leamington and Kingsville administration the proposals were evaluated based upon the following criteria, that being relevant skill, relevant experience and training, price, ability to provide the service, vehicles and equipment, and knowledge of the area. Essex County Canine Services received a higher evaluation in all areas except for knowledge of the area. The price that Essex County Canine Services provided for the service was within the anticipated budget amount. Essex County Canine Services have provided animal control for the town of Lakeshore since 2010 and Essex since 2013. References from those towns as well as the director of the Humane Society and the OPP were included with the RFP. On October 24th, the Joint Animal Control Committee met and reviewed administration's report in connection with the RFP. As a result, they passed uh, the resolution recommending that uh, the, the committee recommend to the respective councils of Kingsville and Leamington that Essex County Canine Services be retained to provide animal control and pound services in the municipalities for a term of three years at an annual cost of $70,000 plus HST and a cost of $70 plus HST for each wild, <coughs> excuse me, wildlife removal call. Um, again, just repeating in the financial impact it, it is at an annual cost of $70,000 plus HST and then the charge of $70 for um, each wildlife removal call plus HST. The, remove, the cost to remove dead animals is included within the service contract price. Uh, just for comparison, the 2017 cost for animal control and pound services were approximately $85,500 plus HST. So it's recommended that Essex County Canine Services be awarded the contract for animal control for the municipality of Leamington and the town of Kingsville for a three-year term commencing on January 1, 2018 at that annual cost and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to enter into the necessary agreements. Questions from Council? Council Riki. Oh, I don't know where I'm going to start this, but uh, uh, lately there's uh, been 19 deer killed on on uh, roads, uh, some injuries, but 19 were killed. But some of those were on county roads. Now, do we pick up the animals on county roads also? No, we do not. Only roads under the jurisdiction of each of the uh, lower tier municipalities. So I live on a county road. There's five or six county roads in here. Would he pick it up then on that county road or does the county come and pick it up? And if, if we pick it up, does the county get charged? No, the county wouldn't get charged. If he's picking it up, we should know that it's in error. Um, that's a call to the county, and they would send out their own forces to pick up on county roads. Yeah. Any other questions? Councillor Hammond? Um, to answer a question that Councillor Jacobs is likely to ask, uh, 
the seventy the seventy thousand dollar quote was less than the other quote that was, that was provided. <laughs> He's already saying. Uh, what are council's wishes? Moved by Councillor Jacob, support by Councillor Verbeke. Discussion on the motion. All in favor? Motion carries. Uh, we have another report regarding application for signed variance since 24 Seacliff Drive East. As Council is aware, we do have a signed bylaw that was passed in 2011. Uh, in this past September, bylaw enforcement officers confirmed that there is a ground sign located at 24 Seacliff Drive East that's in violation of that uh, bylaw because part of the ground side includes advertising for Seacliff Manor, Seacliff Heights, and Seacliff Heights 2, which are residential developments located at 30, 40, and 50 Seacliff Drive East, respectively. Uh, the bylaw indicates that adver advertising goods, products, or services not sold or offered on the property where the sign is located is in contravention of the bylaw. Um, the bylaw does allow for uh, council to grant a variance uh, to that signed bylaw uh, and that council may attach any conditions to that variance that it sees fit. In October, the municipality received an application for such a variance from the owner uh, to permit three billboard signs to be located on the ground sign at 24 Seacliff Drive. Um, the map just provides a, a view of those properties and as you know, this is uh, known as the Pyroli development. So you'll see 24 Seacliff is right at the road. Uh, where the sign is located is right on Seacliff Drive East. And then 30, 40, and 50 is to the rear of uh, 24 Seacliff Drive. Um, the applicant did provide submissions in support of the variance, and he indicated that uh, we are seeking a sign variance because the sign is at the main entrance for four different addresses. The entrance itself along with the plaza is at the address 24 Seacliff Drive East and that same entrance goes to those um, three residential developments to the rear. Administration is recommending that the variance be approved based on the following. At the time of construction of the phases of the development, the intention was for all traffic visiting the sites to use that main entrance. One sign reduces the overall number of directional signs required, and one sign provides a reasonable and appropriate means for the public to locate the facilities and services without difficulty or confusion. So the recommend recommendation is that Council approved the proposed variance in connection with 24 Seacliff Drive East. Thank you, Ruth. Councillor Jacobs. Thank you, Worship. I, I guess looking at this, it'd almost be considered sort of as a mini mall type thing where they have signage out front all the time. So I would move the recommendation. Support by Councillor Dunn. Discussion on the motion. Discussion on the motion. All in favor? Motion carries. Uh, matters for approval. We have the minutes from the Leamington Police Services Board meeting held July 26th. Looking for a mover Problem and seconder. Councillor Jacob moves. Councillor Dunn support. Discussion? All in favor of that motion? Opposed? Carried. Uh, <coughs> minutes for the Kingsville Leamington Animal Control Committee meeting held May 17th. Mover and seconder. Councillor Hammond, Councillor Dunn. Discussion on the motion? All in favor? Motion carries. And the final one is the minutes of the Leamington Accessibility Advisory Committee held September 13th. Looking moved by Councillor Dunn, support by Councillor Hammond. Discussion on the motion. All in favor? Carried. Other matters for consideration are not listed. There's no report on a closed session. Uh, but do we do have consideration of bylaws, Ms. Percy? Bylaw 80-17 being a bylaw to provide for licensing and regulating of businesses in the municipality of Leamington. Bylaw 83-17 being a bylaw to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 890-09 for the municipality of Leamington, which pertains to the subject land ZBA 159, 696, and 698 Talbot Road East. Bylaw 84-17 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Municipality of Leamington at its meeting held November 14, 2017. 
Council's wishes. Moved by Councillor Verbeke, supported by Councillor Hammond. Discussion on the motion. All in favor? Carried. Um, notice of motion that were not circulated, so we're in open session for Council and admin. Councillor Hammond. Your Worship, thank you. Um, I was pleased to be able to be to the Salvation Army last Thursday and help Councillor Dunn, the soup guru, prepare two different kinds of soup that he provided for about 60 or 70 people that were there, including myself. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was well received, and uh, kudos to him. He, he does a nice job, and it's good soup if you ever get a chance to attend. So, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just wanted to report on two conferences I went to. First, I was invited by Aqua to go to the Net Zero uh, conference. That was mainly talking about wastewater plants and reducing their footprint to zero. So the upper levels are funding a biodigester to be built in Stratford. So that then when you have all the stuff that comes out of your water, instead of dewatering it and then taking it to the dump, you put it in a biodigester and then energy and all that. So hopefully they invite me back next year and uh, I, I see how Stratford is, has come along. It's quite interesting. They're putting it, the biodigester will be next to a, a senior's complex, next to the hospital, next oh. to a subdivision. <laughs> so I, I said to him, we'd be watching be to see what, uh, what happens. And just how how close to net zero you can get, but it was very interesting. I was, really enjoyed the the experience. And then last weekend I went to the Kingsville Economic Development Conference, and quite honestly, all of the sessions I will have to say were as interesting as several of the Amo and Osom conferences put together. There was one presentation that I found a bit boring, but it was through lunch, so I could just take my coffee somewhere else. <laughs> but the rest were terribly, terribly interesting. Uh, it, I was only going to go the one day and then I ended up canceling work and, and going the second day because it was that good. I bought a book from one of the speakers, 13 Ways to Kill Your Community, Doug Griffiths. So when I'm finished, if anyone wants to borrow it. Um, actually, Weedsy spoke with him and they're looking to bring him back. He's from Alberta. They're looking to bring him back to this region, perhaps next um, late winter, early spring. He's fabulous, F a dynamic speaker, funny. You just listen to, but he's got some really good points. So that so that was great. And then I made a uh, connection with Jan Hawley, who's the lady that initiated that win this space for filling your empty stores uptown. And I can't wait till we get our new uh, ECDEV manager in because she has agreed she said to me she'd be more than happy to work with us to help us set that up which would be a really good way to fill up some of the empty stores without a tremendous amount of of um, financial input some but you look for sponsors and I think that might be maybe not for this coming year but at least something to work do the groundwork and have it for the next council to implement because it's it's really a great way to get entrepreneurs out of their house and they, they have the free rent, but it's advertising. And really, t to me, I said to her, what w what's key to this? The win this space thing is really just the hook. They trained, they offered um, counseling and information and, and really teaching sessions on how to open a business. And, and, and I think that is actually the seed the, the other is just the covering because so many of her people went on to open businesses regardless of the fact that they won or didn't win. So if you can get a group of budding entrepreneurs and teach them what to do and how to do it correctly, you've already won. So anyway, <coughs> I, I hope that we can work with her um, just, just for guidance and then go from there. But anyway, Fabulous experience. Like I said, I, I got a lot out of it. it. It was well done. Attendance was, eh, could have been better. I was probably, the, yeah, well, the warden and myself were the only county councillors, or councillors, I should say, from the um, county that were there, and uh, Rob Masonville. The rest were other professionals. 
and then they had two of their own Kingsville counselors. So anyway, well worth the time. So if this happens again, be sure and attend. Thank you. Um, the gentleman who wrote that book, The 13 Ways to Kill, we, we did experience him. Was it at an AMO or Osom? Godrich. So the Osom Conference, yeah. And he was really good. So, yeah. Um, so the deputy mayor and then Councillor Dunn. Through you, Your Worship. Um, regarding the Salvation Army um, soup, they, it's a community meal thing. They do it every second Thursday through the winter months for anybody in need. So they can all welcome are welcome to come out uh, for that. I want to thank uh, Councillor Hammond and Jen Robinson and a bunch of volunteers coming out. 100 pounds of potatoes had to be peeled and a lot of cooking. So, I, and they did a lot of the work. So God bless them all for helping that. And to that as well, uh, we're doing another charity. It'll be the Giving Spoon. It's that charity soup thing I do. And we'll be doing it at the bridge on December 9th and 10th, between 11 and 2, all proceeds going to the bridge to help them get them up and running and just added money to going in. You'll get to see the facility, and there'll be 12 varieties of soup each day. So if you feel like coming out, and it's all by donation. You can't pay too much, and you need just to eat, come on out. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Verpeke. Thank you, Worthy Mayor, and thank you, Bill Dunn, to uh, opening up my segue on uh, keep November the 29th open from 11 o'clock till 1 o'clock. There will be 33 soups served for the soup and salad luncheon at the Portuguese Club, and all benefits go for cancer. It's John Welk's big. I am sold out of tickets right now. I'm going to pick some up tomorrow. So it's advances, $8, and it's 10 at the door. And uh, uh, last year there was 800 people there, so parking is, is at a premium, but it's, it's well worth it. And uh, uh, I'll see you there. Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a quick note, I'll piggyback on Deputy Mayor's comments there with uh, Jan Pauly. I think Pauly or Holly, I'm not sure what it was. But anyway, I too listened to her down at AMO. And yes, impressive speaker. Um, I like how you put that, that the, the actual end prize was just the hook. What I really liked about it was how it brought out, it almost exposed a bunch of potential entrepreneurs. Just a simple stay-at-home mom maybe has a great idea you know, but she needs kind of a forum to bring it out. That's where it was just exposed. It, she, the stories that she had about how well it was, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, received, yes. It, it just brought up so many different great ideas. Yeah, I, I hope we explore that more in the, in the future as well. Um, I'm not sure how the economic development uh, officer uh, is proceeding here, but uh, I too look forward to having that uh, come forward at some time. What I did want to speak with, though, is some speeding concerns we've had on uh, Benny Ave, and just how impressive it is to watch how everybody helped out on that. Um, when I got the uh, Gloria Sorrell, she's kind of the leader of Benny Avenue South. I don't know if everybody knew that or not, but <laughs> she speaks for most of that road, and she's quite concerned, and so are the rest of the residents down there. Uh, that's a 40 in that section. Um, and I sat out there for an hour, and sure enough, and me included, uh, nobody's doing 40. But uh, when I reached out to Rob, he was very willing to uh, use our new sign, which I think is turning out to be a great investment for us. I don't know what that message slash speed control sign cost us again, but uh, that has proved, uh, I've seen it at Gore Hill now, I've seen it on Benny. Uh, I think that is gonna be a great little investment that we made in last year's budget. Uh, it's gonna be very helpful. So thank you to Rob, uh, Sergeant Jerry Ribble, uh, also helped out on that. And then the mayor and uh, Councillor Jacobs also uh, helped out at the uh, police services board when they hosted her as a delegate. Uh, I hope that things get better over on Benny Avenue once uh, Danforth gets opened back up. But uh, I know the police have issued uh, quite a few uh, tickets since uh, this matter was first brought up, but. Thanks again, Rob, for helping out. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Anyone else? Any from staff? Anything? Oh, Councillor Jacobs. Thank you, Worship. Um, I, I just want to note with, uh, with a lot of great excitement, really. I know we all look at the downtown, refurbishing downtown and so forth, but as you go down Erie Street South, you see the investments that are being made uh, in that particular area. Uh, the Canadian Tire, the old Zellers location, uh, you know, the corner of Seacliff and uh, Erie uh, and so forth. 
like these are major corporations from out of town that are s investing significant dollars in these upgrades. I, I mean, look at that parking lot at Zellers. I'll bet you that's a million dollar plus job that they've put into that. And, and I think it just attests to the fact that we are moving forward. And I think if we have these corporations that are willing to come over here and invest that type of funds, that they have faith in our community and we are moving forward. So I think that's a could do to our administration for moving in that direction as, as well as our council here. You know, uh, I think we're going in the right direction and it's, uh, it's really gratifying to see. I know I'm excited, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but, but I drive by all the time and I say, man, this is fantastic. So I just, you know, just kudos to everyone that's involved in this and the planning departments and so forth that are assisting and uh, just wanted to get that out there. Thank you. You're very good. Okay, just real quick for me then to wind it up. <coughs> Excuse me, on uh, Friday, November 3rd, was the annual Heritage Committee's uh, banquet and awards night, and Councillor Verbeke very much uh, a big part of that. And uh, I think pretty much all of us were, th you, but you were away, right? Anyway, um, most of Council was there for that evening, and uh, $3,700 raised. I just asked that question the other day. So... Uh, great, great night, and a lot of uh, very worthy people received that the recognition they deserve. On Friday, November 10th, uh, we all attended the Employee Appreciation Night, and uh, some new initiatives there brought forward by our CAO, um, where people really were recognized for things other than retiring and long-term service, which is all great stuff, but... Uh, our own staff recognize each other for, I guess, the, the professionalism they, they bring um, in, into their different uh, occupations here in Town Hall and, and our other facilities. So uh, a big thank you, I think, goes out to the CAO and the staff that uh, did all the organizing for that event, and, and it was really, really wonderful. Don't know how you're going to top it next year, so good luck on that. Um, and finally, Saturday, November 11th, uh, everybody knows it's Remembrance Day. Um, there were a few of us there uh, from Council, and it's always a, a definite honour to be asked to say a few words. Um, and again, I'll say it to the general audience, uh, that, that standing up there at the podium, <coughs> sharing a few words with everyone, looking around and seeing the number of people that attended that. I, I you know, I, I wouldn't even hazard a guess, maybe 500 that were there, maybe more than that. Uh, it was totally impressive. Um, normally it's during the week and the schools come, um, but this, this time was on a Saturday and it, it was, it, it would just, it was, it just gave me a great amount of pride to be the mayor of Leamington and, and I'm sure Councillor Hammond and Councillor Verbeke, I, I don't know if the rest of you were there that I didn't see, but it, it had to instill pride in you too, seeing the turnout that, that we had in this municipality. And so I just want to give a big thank you to the Wheatley Legion. Ours is closed, unfortunately, but to the Wheatley Legion, Legion for organizing the, the day, and it was a huge success. So well, that's for me. Uh, statements, members, non-debatable. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Hammond, Councillor Dunn. Discussion on the motion. All in favor? Motion carries. Good night.